One ring to rule them all, one ring to find them, one ring to bring them all, and in the darkness, bind them. Greetings. <laughs> uh, ooh, theatrics. Uh, I am back from traveling. Uh, lots on my mind, lots going on in the world. Uh, yes, I am doing another Tolkien reference from Lord of the Rings. Um, I've been putting together an advanced kind of theory of how power uh, is driving um, humans towards a cliff, uh, quite frankly. So today I'd like to talk about the one ring of power, metaphorically from the Lord of the Rings. Um, and before I get to that, I'd like to talk about the nine rings for mortal men, which are behavioral tendencies of our species, Homo sapiens, that have been successful for 290,000 years in ancestral tribes on the savanna in Tanzania, Kenya, Africa, um, but are misfiring in our current uh, globalized, technologically advanced, energy rich culture. Um, I do periodically get criticism that the content on this channel is derivative of the same themes. Um, and while that's true, the content is derivative of we're animals, we're human, uh, behaviors matter, uh, the energy and money and growth uh, are this synergy that is pulling humanity forward, and we're impacting ecology and the ecosystems of Earth. It's kind of obvious once you see it, and yet if your hair was on fire, I would continue to point out that your hair was on fire uh, until you recognized it. <laughs> So the nine rings for mortal men. First of all, we're animals, we're primates. Humans are predators. <laughs> we don't think about it much, uh, but ancestral times we coordinated uh, to hunt a game. Uh, there was an EROI equation there, optimal foraging theory. And today we are hunting uh, using fossil energy to do most of our labor but we're hunting bargains and we're hunting good investment returns where we invest a little and get a lot. Uh, but we are apex predators. Um, that is one of our rings of power. The second is that dopamine in our historical environment was a neurotransmitter that led to motivation, action, and reward. If we saw some movement by the bushes or some animal in the trees, uh, it would alert us, um, and so we recognize that salience, that salience led to reward or safety. Today, we get the reward without doing the work. So our evolutionary impulse is misfiring. Uh, not only that, but so many of us have become addicted to dopamine that we don't have a portfolio of other op uh, options like storytelling or campfires or sleeping or uh, a dalliance in the bushes that our ancestors had. So we continue uh, in, in the dopamine rut. The third ring of power uh, for humans is loss aversion. So in our ancestral environment, if we uh, forego, uh, uh, foregone, forewent, <laughs> if we at the time forego a meal uh, or defer something, it would have been uh, consumed by someone else. We were very um, sensitive to losses because if we didn't have something and we lost it uh, a week or two without food and we would die. So a loss in ancestral times on the plains of Tanzania would mean death, which is why today uh, we go through life uh, amassing things and digits in our bank. And when we lose money or lose things, it's like going backwards in a Avis rental car thing where it says, don't back up or your tires will pop. Uh, physiological research shows that a windfall profit of 10%, like going from $10,000 to $11,000, 
psychically feels a certain amount, but then uh, a simultaneous loss from 11,000 to 10,000 right back to where you started is a much larger negative feeling. This is part of our behavioral tendencies that losses feel worse than gains. And obviously you can see the implications uh, that that has in a global uh, debt-fueled, uh, overconsumptive, uh, overshot consumption system. The fourth uh, emanates from that is we are very tribal species. For most of our evolutionary past, we lived in small bands of 30 to 200 uh, people, and we never traveled more than 10 miles or so from, from where we were born often. Um, we were intensely supportive of our tribe. Uh, we coordinated against dangers like predators, and we coordinated against other tribes when there was resource scarcity or uh, territorial conflict, etc. So tribalism and war is part of uh, the nine rings for mortal men. The fifth, uh, again, is we are biological, finite lifespan creatures. And because of that, even though we have long lifespans relative to most animals, we intensely value the present more than the future. And that in today's era um, really matters because many of our real big problems are only going to manifest in the future, so we don't seem to care about them. Uh, this has been adaptive in the past, but is now maladaptive for the decisions we have to make. Uh, the sixth is group think. We are such a social uh, species. We look to others to confer um, support and approval for what we're saying. And this has gone haywire in a social media age uh, where people can find whatever they believe in supported online. Um, it, it leads to populist uh, thinking, the consensus trance. It leads to uh, narratives that are counter to what the media and the general zeitgeist says, being threatening, uh, being canceled, uh, et cetera. Um, so we are uh, a, a species that really looks to others for approval. The seventh is we don't like uncertainty because uncertainty takes up some of our emotional bandwidth. Because of that, when we hear a scientific or a true story, we only believe that if the truth helps our fitness. If the fitness uh, isn't served or our perception of our fitness, we tend to disregard the truth, which is why there are dueling stories on climate change and nuclear power and resource depletion and Republicans and Democrats and all these other things. Um, we're easily swayed towards a narrative that helps our perception of our own situation. Uh, ancestrally, um, we didn't have all this because things were simple and the every day was pretty much like yesterday was pretty much like the year before. Uh, but now things are changing so fast that uncertainty is actually uncomfortable. Um, building on that, and this I have a lot of personal anecdotes on from when I ran the oil drum uh, and when I see important people around the world, our species, especially medium to high status males, are incredibly hubristic. And um, this had its origins in something called dispersal theory in biology. There was something called a prophet phenotype that would go out or be kicked out from a certain tribe and would start a new uh, group elsewhere, like a bigger fish in a smaller pond. The amount of unbelievable confidence of people that know the response to limits to growth, energy depletion, climate change, biodiversity loss, this is the answer, um, is a worrisome trait because um, the truth is there are no easy answers. It's really complex. I don't know what to do, which is why this podcast will never be super popular because I'm never going to be pounding the table that I have a solution or an answer. Um, I am going to pound the table on things that I believe to be scientifically valid. But my point here in this eighth um, 
ring of power of humans is hubris and overconfidence. Lastly, um, we grew up in tandem with nature, but we were at such a small scale um, that this never was a problem. And today, uh, in order to defend our current consumption habits and the current uh, zeitgeist in the news, anthropocentrism, that humans are above and apart from nature uh, and that we're special, um, is one of the uh, nine rings of mortal men uh, behaviorally. So we have a lot of good traits too. We, have, we are kind and we're clever and inventive and altruistic and sharing and funny and artistic and all these things. But these nine things I just mentioned are specifically deleterious to our current social situation. But what they all have in common is they are all in thrall to the one ring, the one ring that binds them, which in our society, not so metaphorically to the ring of power from the Lord of the Rings, is the synergy, the complex synergy of 10,000 years ago, agricultural surplus allowed us to specialize and create hierarchies and eventually create uh, new jobs and uh, um, chieftains and mayors and nation states. Then fossil surplus which we had a moonshot adding hundreds of billions of laborers that the world got effectively a thousand times larger population and consumption versus 500 years ago. On top of that, we overlaid money. The world's reserve currency, which is currently the US dollar, but there are many major currencies. Those are created by banks when they make loans. The interest is not created. And these are, importantly, fungible, which means that anyone in the world that has U.S. dollars can instantly turn it into anything, can turn it into land, can turn it into airplanes, can turn it into houses, can turn it into a company, can turn it into liquid investments, can turn it into social influence. And so as long as we have a fungible currency like that on the backs of energy surplus, on the backs of agricultural surplus, the Tower of Sauron continues to, like Jack and the Beanstalk, um, creep towards the sky, and it is unstoppable. Now, building on that, shooting it even higher in the sky, is artificial intelligence, which increasingly is going to mature. And if you think that the leveraged returns on the natural world from energy are large, and on top of that, the leverage returns of finance on top of energy. Now we're going to have the leverage returns from AI on top of all of it. And even AGI, artificial general intelligence, which leaves out the human in the decision process. Why is this important? I've talked about the superorganism. This is at the beating heart of the superorganism, is this quest for power that is mindless and incredibly strong. Um, Moloch, which is uh, a, a concept that Liv Bory and Daniel Schmachtenberger and others talk about, you could argue is the personality or the temperament of the superorganism. But what ends up happening is people, especially rich humans, have optionality to continue amassing power. And just like the same way that the superorganism culture, our culture, uh, outcompeted those wise, less consumptive, more wide boundary thinking cultures. Those humans that continue to funnel more and more power um, have outsized optionality in the future. I met with a billionaire this summer, super good guy, understands my work, understands what's at stake. I asked him to support uh, the organization. Maybe sometime in the future, right now, we're uh, invested in, in liquid equities and we are, are growing um, our portfolio so that we have more money to donate in the future. Uh, and I thought that was kind of ridiculous, but now that I think about how all this plays together, the synergy of 
agriculture, energy, money, and now artificial intelligence are this vortex that is spinning upwards and pulling everything into its wake. I call this podcast The Great Simplification because I think eventually we won't be able to have the energy and materials to continue growth. And because we built so many financial claims uh, in order to keep consuming, that is going to spiral downward and we're going to have a Great Depression sort of thing. It is possible that that is deferred uh, five or 10 years. And I'm going to talk about that next week on how AI interrelates with climate and energy. But in the meantime, this power dynamic is accentuating in a, in a bad way, these nine rings of mortal men that I described, these behavioral tendencies for humans. Uh, and I don't know what to do about this until that uh, beating heart at the core of the superorganism, which is fungible reserve currencies on top of energy surplus, accentuated by AI and soon to be AGI, until that changes, I don't know what can stop it. It is truly uh, Sauron. Uh, and all I can do is hope that the eye of Sauron doesn't turn its gaze to Red Wing, Minnesota, and I can continue to educate people about how these things fit together and, and come up with, uh, with off ramps and, and uh, guideposts for where to go from here. Um, the one ring, the invisible ring, um, Tristan Harris was on my podcast last year and, and we, we called the podcast about AI and social media, bringing the ring to Mordor. And I thought it was kind of a clever, pithy phrase, but now a year later, I'm like, yeah, that was kind of apt. I'll talk to you next week. Um, thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>